right, here's everybody. Hello, and welcome to the RX Hope Cable Talks, session number six. This session is being recorded. My name is Leah Myers, and I am the executive director for the Families SCN Toy Foundation. We are very excited to be bringing this virtual educational experience to our global community. During these sessions, the families and caregivers of the patients with SCN2A related disorders will be referred to as the experts, and the presenters will be the professionals. The goal of the virtual table talks is to allow experts unprecedented access to professional researchers and clinicians working diligently to find a cure for our children. This is meant to be a very casual environment and your questions and comments are encouraged as we are all here to learn from one another. To keep things running smoothly, please keep your audio on mute and use the reactions button to raise your hand if you would like to talk. Or you could just type your question into the chat if you feel more comfortable. Feel free to leave your video on, we're all here to see each other. If you haven't already, please introduce yourself and your child with SCN2A in the chat. Perhaps just their name, age, how SCN2A presents, like if they have autism, epilepsy, or both, um, and where you live. I now have the pleasure to hand this over to Dr. Kevin Bender from UCSF and Dr. Yang Yang from Purdue, who will be talking about SCN2A loss of function, a possible explanation on why some have seizures and others don't. Thanks so much, Leah. Um, I just wanna thank everybody for coming on behalf of Yang and I. Um, this is, as Leah mentioned, a very, very relaxed environment. You can see I'm wearing a t-shirt, I'm at home. Um, I can play some ukulele if you really want, but you do not want me to. Um, and Yang and I have prepared probably about 20 or so minutes of slides that are, that are hopefully very accessible. Um, to talk a little bit about some work that we just had published like last week, which is really, really nice. It was a, it was an, a situation that was actually mediated by one of, one of these meetings that we had before with the family group um, where uh, we were able to give talks and actually learn about both of our research and, and discover by accident that we were studying something very, very similar and very unexpected um, in both of our labs and came to the same unexpected conclusions. And it was, a, it was a real pleasure to be able to submit those papers as one does in academia and get them published back to back recently. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about uh, more about that. So today's talk is going to mostly focus, I'll try and share a portion of my screen, on those kids that develop seizures or develop epilepsy, but also are diagnosed with what would otherwise be called a loss of function variant in SCN2A. These are the kids that generally present with seizures later in life, and by that I mean after a year in life. Um, and typically we would, uh, uh, clinicians would say that, um, and you'll probably know better than me since you are the experts, that these are the ones that are best treated by anti-epileptics that actually do not block sodium channels. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about why this might actually occur. It's a, it's a relatively unique condition when you have a loss of a sodium channel, which is normally excitatory for neurons. How could that actually lead to something like epilepsy in conditions where we know SCN2A is mostly expressed in cells that are really exciting or driving, uh, driving the brain? And so... We'll just take a little bit of a step back, and you guys probably know this slide very well, um, uh, made up by Stephanie, you probably talked about it on Saturday, where we have this general spectrum and in broad, broad strokes, our understanding of SCN2A and gain of function, loss of function, sort of falls into these categories where when you have very, very severe gain of function, you can have epileptic encephalopathy. This often occurs very, very young in life. These are, uh, treatable, but probably not managed very, very well with current anti-epileptics that are sodium channel blockers. And people in the audience like JP are working on better sodium channel blockers um, it, that hopefully will come to the market soon. Um, on the flip side, you can have reduced function in these uh, NAV 1.2 channels or SCN2A, 
and that can give rise to autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, and then in some cases, we see seizures associated with those children. Now, <clears throat> the, the real prevalence, and oh, by the way, in the middle is benign infantile seizures. Um, those are cases that actually resolve over life, and so we generally don't find those very often in the family group, as far as I understand. Um, if you look at the prevalence of these different types of phenotypes associated with SCN2 8 gain of function and loss of function, and you just count up based on the genetics and, and how often a variant in the channel is likely to give rise to one or the other, you'll actually notice that it's a very large group that should be associated with autism spectrum disorder, almost five to one compared to epileptic encephalopathy. And so within the family group, we would actually expect that we would see probably five times more children presenting with autism spectrum disorder and intellectual disability than those that we see with epileptic encephalopathies um, or seizures associated with loss of function. And that's clearly not the case right now. Um, my best understanding of it, and you guys tell me, um, but my best understanding is it's about half-half. And what we tend to see in the group is that we see loss of function cases that are very commonly associated with seizure. And the odds of actually seeing a child present just with intellectual disability and autism or autism spectrum disorder without seizure is actually relatively low right now in the family group. And we think that that's honestly because of ascertainment. If you have a child that develops a seizure, you're very likely to have uh, to, to be able to have access to uh, genome screening for uh, epilepsy candidates. And uh, talking with many parents, those that, that have children that just present with intellectual disability, it's actually a real big fight to convince their healthcare, um, uh, uh, healthcare providers to allow them to get uh, genome screens. Um, when it's actually really, really necessary. So I'm hoping that that, that changes over the years. And uh, I know Stefan and I are working pretty hard at UCSF that basically any child that comes into uh, the NICU gets a genome screen, no matter what the diagnosis. Um, so that's where things are kind of pushing. But it's these kids with, and we estimate it's about 20% of the total population of these loss of function cases that develop um, that develop seizure. Those are the ones we want to talk about today. And those are the ones you, you encounter quite often. Um, and we would like to try and understand why that is. Why, why when we have a loss of function, um, can, you, uh, can you actually see increased excitability when the, the, our best understanding about this is that um, this is predominantly um, a case where you're having loss of function in excitatory cells in your cortex, which is at the top of your brain, and in inhibitory cells, which then disinhibit other cells in a part of your brain called the striatum, which Yang will talk about in much more detail. And so we want to study this in the lab. How the heck are we going to do that? We're not going to use kiddos. Um, we're going to use mice. And so Yang and I have been working on this a lot, and also a group um, the Yamakawa group in Japan has also been working on this for quite some time. And what they have found is that if you study a mouse that is uh, a good model of loss of function, where you have one lost copy or one dampened copy and one normal copy, that's called KO plus in this case, you'll see elevated epileptiform like activity in these mice in two particular regions. One is called the medial prefrontal cortex. That's up here. It's, it's the last part of your brain to develop. It's the part of your brain, if, uh, if you have a neurotypical uh, teenager, it's still developing and they're, they're fighting you all the way. Um, and then also in this area called the caudate putamen, which is otherwise known as the striatum. And it just so happened that Yang and I decided to divide and conquer without knowing that we were dividing and conquering. And we studied what was going on in terms of seizure susceptibility in the prefrontal cortex, and Yang was studying what's going on in the caudate putamen. And it was based, predicated on this study from the Yamakawa group showing that both of these regions are areas where you can have excess activity, um, uh, <clears throat> excess activity when you have a loss of function. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is that um, SCN2A is really, really unique amongst the sodium channels in the brain that are associated with different disorders. It's the only one that we know about. And it, uh, unfortunately, I'm excluding NAB 
uh, uh, NAV 1.3 here. Um, I'm only focusing on 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 6, which you know from Dravet syndrome with 1A, um, 2A is us, and then 8A is also wishes for Elliot. Um, there are cases where with 2A and 8A, there's very clear epileptic encephalopathy. Um, with 1A, when you have gain of function, it's actually associated with migraines. Um, and you have to go to loss of function in 1A to have epilepsy. And that's because 1A is predominantly expressed in interneurons. And so when you lose inhibition, that then is a sort of a, it's, it's like a plus minus sign change. It's old algebra. You have a minus minus, it leads to a plus, it leads to excess excitation in the pyramidal cells. By contrast, 2 and 8 and 8A eight are predominantly expressed in the excitatory cells. So there you can have gain of function and you have excess activity. And with loss of function in 8A, you actually have intellectual disability and no known seizures. It's this strange condition with 2A where you can have um, both gain of function and loss of function contribute to epilepsy. So this was the big question that we wanted to address. And luckily we had these um, two nice papers back to back these articles can currently be found. And the nice thing about cell reports is it is a, um, it is a free publishing. Uh, it, uh, we pay the rights to make this open access to everyone right at the start. And so if you go to this link down here, you can find both of these papers. And if what I'm saying doesn't make sense, you can read the nitty gritty and try and make sense of what we actually wrote. Um, and so I, we tried to write it as, as well as possible. But we're both of these papers are focused on trying to understand why when you have loss of function, you can actually have hyper excitability in, in cells like these. And so one of the things that we did was take advantage of, oh, and sorry, before I get there, I wanna do a little bit more background. And I just wanna show you some previous work that we've done on cases where we looked at SCN2A over development. And so one thing that you have to realize, if we just focus on the work that we've done in pyramidal cells, is that very early in development in these pyramidal cells or excitatory cells, NAV 1.2 or SCN2A is the first sodium channel to develop in these cells. And very early in life, when you lose that channel, you actually have a loss in the excitability of these cells. So this is normal activity of these cells with increasing drive onto the neuron. And with increasing drive, the cells fire these things called action potentials and they fire more and more and more. You can see that for the equivalent drive in an SCN2A heterozygote, um, which is a loss of function mimic of a human, you see less and less activity in those cells. And you can see that reflected in what's called a firing over current uh, or FI curve where this is the normal number of spikes evoked for a given current, and you can see it's less in the heterozygote. Okay, so now the interesting thing and the thing that's confusing to us is that later in life, NAV 1.2 gets displaced by, by NAV 1.6, which is SCN8A in the distal action, uh, uh, axon. And in those conditions, 8A actually takes over the job of firing or initiating these action potentials and 2A um, is relegated to a different role and it takes over in the dendrite. Now, under those conditions in a heterozygote, since 8A is driving the spike initiation, we actually don't see any condition where there's hyper or hypo excitability once 8A has taken over that role. And so in some respects, this mouse, which is the perfect phenotypic or genotypic copy of a human, captures some aspects of the human phenotype. It, it actually did pretty well in terms of capturing intellectual disability phenotypes and autism spectrum disorder phenotypes at the cellular level, but it did very poorly in terms of being able to assess this hyper excitability. And if we go back to that Ogawara work, um, uh, here you'll notice that this activity is actually relatively sparse. It's on the order of eight per hour. And so you really have to, to have to search. And it's just something that's really, really hard to see if you use the techniques that Yang and I are using, um, or mostly me that using, which is making chopping up little bits of the brain and studying cells in isolation almost. And so one of the, the real tricks that, that Yang and I took advantage of is to um, basically ask the question of, okay, well, if we can't see anything at 50% loss, what if we go further? 
And Yang and I tackled this in two different ways. Um, Yang made this really fancy mouse called a gene trap mouse, um, which sequesters um, SCN2A and it lowers its, its expression by 75%. And that is a case that is even more extreme than what we would see in children. And I call those very reduced in a gene trap. He'll talk about the results there. Um, what we did was we used something called a conditional knockout mouse where we can instruct individual neurons in the brain to stop producing NAV 1.2 channels or SCN2A, and we can tell it to stop producing all of them. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to, to each of these approaches. Um, the advantage to, to the conditional knockout is we can get rid of everything. The disadvantage of it is we could only do that at a particular point in development. And we chose to do it really late in development to try and study what's going on later. Um, Yang was able to do things where he had a 75% reduction throughout life. And that actually uh, produces very interesting results. Um, you could also ask, well, why don't you just knock out SCN2A completely throughout life? Actually, that was tried about 22 years ago. And it turns out that the animals unfortunately die um, a day or two after being born. And that's because very early in life, this sodium channel is critical for driving your diaphragm and the animals just couldn't breathe. Okay, so with this, what did we find? And I'm trying to explain this as, as, as easily as possible, but the long and the short of it is, is under these conditions, we found that there's actually no change in excitability. What was surprising to us is when we made this conditional knockout case, we actually were able to observe very strong changes in excitability in these cells. It was very overt. Um, the numbers there are just numbers of cells. And the long and the short of it is this. Um, what happens is, under normal conditions, if you look at this black action potential here, normally an action potential rises to a very, very strong level, and then it engages other channels. So, for example, KCNQ, you, you'll know about these, um, about these things because there are other family groups that are associated with disorders in these, so, in these potassium channels. So, for example, the KCNQ uh, alliance. Um, I'm getting that right, right? Yes, okay, good. Um, so for example, if you depolarize an act, uh, a neuron very, very strongly, it will engage those potassium channels that then drive it to repolarize. Under normal conditions, that repolarization is very, very strong. And so it takes a cell a long, long time to get to the next spike. But if you lose sodium channels, and in particular, if you lose NAV 1.2, the cell does not depolarize as strongly, and that leads to an impair, it leads to an incomplete recruitment of these potassium channels. And what happens is the cell doesn't repolarize as much, and it's just closer to firing the next action potential. And that, what we found, is that alone was sufficient to increase excitability. And the thing that was kind of interesting to us is that this relationship between sodium channels and potassium channels wasn't a linear relationship at all. In the mice, what we found was this. If you look at the sodium channel density, and this is reducing sodium channel density from 1.2 1, 1 density from 100% all the way down to zero, and remembering that we have SCN8A also in these cells. So that's why the sodium, uh, the sodium current doesn't go to zero. What we see is that there's a, a progressive loss of that current, that activity associated with that channel. But if we then look at the engagement of potassium channels related to that, you can see it actually falls off with a curve. This falls off linearly, this falls off with a curve because these channels aren't directly related to each other. They, they have some indirect relationships. And so if you just quantify that relationship, what you'll see is that there's actually relatively linear um, relationships between the activity the, uh, the activity at 100% at or wild type neurotypical levels and at 50% where you're at that SCN2A loss of function heterozygote level that we see in our kiddos. It's only when you get past that that we see this fall off this cliff and it really rises in terms of excitability. We were studying things out here. Yang, was, Yang studied things sort of in this case. And we both found very similar results. And so what one interpretation of this is that, and this is how I'm thinking about it, is that if you have a kiddo that sort of sits at this cliff edge, um, anything else that's in their background and their environment might be either protective of seizure 
or makes them sort of prone to seizure. And that might help explain why this little cliff edge um, is basically, basically we're observing loss of function kids uh, giving rise to seizure every once in a while, 20% of the time, 30% of the time. So that's, that's our basic interpretation of it right now. Obviously lots more work to do, um, but one of the more important things to do is, oh geez, not skip through all of Yang's slides, um, but turn it over to him so he can explain what happened with the gene trap maps. Okay, thank you, Kevin. That's a wonderful introduction and the discussion of your data as well as our data. I also want to thank um, Leah for giving us this opportunity to talk about our research and uh, discuss how our research can eventually help the kids. Uh, Kevin, can you advance one slide? So as Kevin just mentioned, we are using a very different approach to tackle the problem that 100% uh, knockout of the mice since the birth is do not survive. So how can we solve that issue? So Kevin using a very smart way to kind of just knock out SN2 in a small portion of neuron so that the, the mouse can still alive and they can study how the neuron function. But for us, we, we, we want to figure out if we reduce the SN2 to a very severe level since the birth, what will happen to these mice? So you can see Kevin was reading my mind and tried to <laughs> point out which slide we should talk about. Yes, we are actually looking at this mice you will see. We have the white type, white type meaning that's the neurotypical mice. And the middle one is the heterozygous. It's just like a, uh, the published before. It's like 50%, about 50% of the SN2 was uh, reduced. And we are mainly interested in this tiny small mice, which we call a gene trap mice. You know, they look very small compared to the white type neurotypical mice. And when we handle these mice, when they are young, like uh, 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 two or three, four days after birth, you cannot see the difference. But after past day 10 or day 20, you're gonna see these mice is, is much smaller and many of them, unfortunately, they're gonna die during the process. So my graduate student, Muria, she has a love for this animal. She kind of putting this uh, gel cup or kind of supporting things to the, 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 this cage. So to make this animal, uh, survive better. So at the current stage, we was able to get more than 80% of these mice survive, survived and still we lost 20% of the mice, which indicating the, uh, the SN2 related uh, deficiency is quite um, uh, important for the, for, for the brain and uh, we actually see very big phenotype. So in the, the data you can see here, the female and the male, the survival rate is, is a little bit different, but you know, it's about uh, uh, we can we can get about 80% of mice survive to the adulthood and then we can study them. Kevin, can you advance one? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, um, Kevin mentioned that we use a quite a complex, complicated uh, geno genomic editing, not editing, ge the ge geno genomic manipulation approach to actually insert something called the gene trap cassette. You see, this is a very, um, Kind of complicated thing. There's a lot of elements there. The purpose of this gene trap cassette is to trap the gene transcription into that cassette so that you don't make, you no longer make a full length channel so that you can reach a reduction. Using this cassette, as Kevin just mentioned, we are able to uh, knock down or reduce the sodium channel 1.2 to about 20 to 25% of the wild type or neurotypical mouse. And the beauty of this cassette is, you can see there are some element we call the FRAT log P or this, this element actually can allow us to do further genetic manipulation. So basically if we put in some virus as we showed here at the mouse that that's a very cute mice. If we inject some virus into the mice with this FLP element, this FLP element actually can cleave this, this trapping cassette so that the mouse genome no longer have this trapping cassette. So guess what? When the mice no longer have this trapping cassette, they will produce sodium channel as if they are normal mice, right? So basically we can using this approach to test if we restore the sodium channel 1.2 in adulthood, do we see any rescue in our behavior? So that's 
actually very surprising and uh, encouraging to us. You can see from the data we show, when we uh, have the wild type of mice, right, you know, it's uh, firing at a certain level. And when we have this homo mice, which we call the homozygous for this gene trap, we see a such a increase the neuronal excitability. And as Kevin just mentioned, the increase in neuronal excitability is related to, 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 to seizure uh, susceptibility. And then after we inject this flipper into the adult mice, you can see Kevin was pointing to that, we was really nicely reduce the hyper excitable neuron firing to the level very close to the white type. This actually is, is quite remarkable as Kevin may already mentioned before, that the neuron have different level of excitability. They can be hyper excitable, they can be hypo excitable, they can be like a white type of neuron typical. And when we doing this uh, uh, um, modulation, we will actually somehow just reduce it to the level that are very close to the white type. So this is very kind of encouraging. And I just put in this wording saying from our mouse data, right? It's not a human, it's not a drug from the mouse data. We're actually suggesting if we can do gene therapy, even in adulthood, we may be able to see a beneficial effect for, for the kiddo. You know, this, this drug developmental gene therapy take a very long time. And we are working as fast as we can try to push this, but it is still take very long. But this is like some hope we are trying to provide to the, to the family that even your kiddo is reaching adulthood, even they are grow up, and uh, once the gene therapy may be that time, they may be available and it's maybe helpful for, for the kid, right? This is this mouse data, they may not be true in the human, but I feel like this data actually give us some hope that uh, the gene therapy could be useful in the future. Uh, Kevin, can you advance one more slide? Yeah. Great. Also, like we are in the pharmacology department we want to test some uh, compounds. So in our, a very advanced assay we call the RNA sequencing assay. Basically, we look at the transcriptome, meaning we look at the, all the molecule E expressed in the neuron when we knock down or knock out SN2A to see when we kind of, the SN2A is low, is there any other genes or proteins or molecule they are compensated when they see the SN2A is getting low. And I didn't show the data just to show, to, to save the time, but a very, Excitingly, we find many potassium channels, many of them is, is, is like down-regulated, meaning also the e expression level is getting low when the neuron has a low SN2A. So when we see that data, then the next question we're gonna ask is, uh, since the, uh, the potassium channel is getting low, if we open the potassium channel to make them function better, is that able to kind of compensate for the reduce the potassium channel and eventually change the neuronal excitability. So we actually tested two compounds here. One is the Kevin just mentioned, it's a, using his mouse to, to point out, it's called a, the PIMA, it's a PIMA. It's a, a more general KV channel open. And you can see very nicely using this general um, potassium channel open, we was also able to reduce the hyper excitability to the level that is very close to the to the white type and the neurotypical mice. That is also quite remar re remarkable. That time when I, actually I can give you some side story. That time when I um, found this result, I, I, I found this drug, I want to gene out, you know, my, my, my postdoc to do that. He said, no, 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 this is not, not going to work out. This potassium channel is so, they have so many different targets. We're going to just, uh, maybe reduce the action, uh, the action potential firing to very low level, you know, it's, it's not relevant. I said, Jinan, come on, just give it a try. And after a week, he, he talked to me, said, Dr. Yuan, this is ridiculous. I put this drug, they just reduce the firing to the white type level. It's, it's, it's so kind of amazing or strange to me. Then I said, see, Jinan, you know, we have to try this type of stuff. Yeah, this is actually, <laughs> he didn't want to do it in the first place. I convinced him to do that. Then after that, uh, we tried another drug, which is called a 4TFMPG. It's a more specific KV 1.1 channel open. We tried this because there are some previous publication suggesting there are some gene therapy. They produce a copy of KV 1.1. They was able to kind of uh, reduce the seizure. 
So recently that paper was just published, I think in 2019, they found that there are small molecule that was able to open the KV 1.1. So I said, well, let's try this as well. So using this drug, we was also be able to see, we're gonna reduce uh, the excitability of the neuron. In this data set, we didn't show the Y cap. The reason we didn't show that time is that the effect of this uh, T for TFMPG is not as nice as the PIMA. It's actually do not reduce it to the Y type level. It's uh, sitting between the Y type and the homo. So, I mean, um, it, it's not a, a, as perfect as the PMA. So we actually just show you the data that they can reduce it, but they didn't compare this to the Y type. Anyway, so these two data actually give us additional hope. Maybe we can target in potassium channel that uh, open this potassium channel somehow can help to reduce the seizure in the situation if the kid has a uh, SN2A deficiency. But again, we want to really emphasize what we're testing here, the PIMA, the 4TF, MPG, you know, that's just some strange name. It's not a drug. It's just some experimental compound. You, you're not gonna see this in the, in the pharmacy. And uh, <clears throat> from this uh, experimental compound to drug, there's really long way to go. You have to see if they have side effect, you will have to see if they are dissolved in, in, in solvent, if they have PKPD, there's a lot, a lot of things have to go into developing certain experimental compound become a drug, right? So we, we just want to emphasize again, and again, this is not a medication. We are suggesting this drug could be helpful in our basic research. Um, yeah, that is something I want to emphasize here. Uh, Kevin, can you advance one more? Okay, so you know this is the conclusion is based on Kevin's slide as well as our data. So basically, it's a combined uh, conclusion. I just uh, speak for Kevin in certain way. So basically, Kevin found that for SN2A minus minus meaning it's a hundred percent knockout. When you have hundred percent knockout, you're going to cause the pyramidal cell. And and actually, Kevin did a very nice thing called SN2A trap. So, you know, we put the GDK. It's not so intuitive. Then later, I think I'm going to use it this way. I say, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think this is a nice way to do it. You know, this is about 75% or 80%. The MSM neuron, which is another major brain area involved in seizure. We, we two lab, it's very fascinating. We studied two brain regions. We're using two different approach. We find the same conclusion. The knockdown or knockout of SN2A beyond the 50% is going to cause the neuron to be hyper excitable. That's the main conclusion from the both papers. Then Kevin's paper, he is more um, uh, investigating how the interaction between the potassium conductance and the sodium conductance, and they have some interplay over there. And in our study, we are more focused on this uh, so, um, the sodium channel ear expression and the potassium channel ear expression. And we also find the potassium channel ear expression level is, is, is reduced to compensate. So that part is kind of different, but kind of support, suggesting to the same potassium channel, but in different way. And as just Kevin mentioned that, you know, the neuron may be on the edge of the cliff, you know, if there are anything like a different genetic background or different like a perturbation, maybe some kind of, uh, I don't know, like a TBI, there's some hit in the brain or they have some fever or anything like a, like a tip of the balance maybe we'll, we'll, we'll kind of uh, lead to, to seizure in these kids. So in this sense, you know, we are not a clinician, but maybe from the data we can think, um, we try to protect the kids, you know, don't, don't, don't want their head to be hit somewhere. You know, sometimes if they have uh, uh, some, um, some common cold, maybe, you know, try to be careful not to let them have like a strong fever. You know, I, I don't know, you know, this is a clinician may have to, we have to talk about this stuff, but uh, you know, we are basic scientists that we, we just like imagination, imagine yeah, stuff. Which translate, may not, may not translate be translated into the section where we have to preface everything by saying we are not clinicians. Exactly. See, we're not clinicians. And all of our so advice should be taken with a grain of salt, a very, very large grain of salt. Exactly. Hewn so, from a cave uh -huh. somewhere. Yes, yes. So exactly, <laughs> Kevin, you don't really want to emphasize on this and uh, as we, uh, me and Kevin was mentioned, maybe some potassium channel activator may be helpful. Maybe there are some other drug to reduce the, uh, bur the bursting fire of the neuron may be helpful. But again, Kevin mentioned, you have to talk to your clinician 
we are just giving you some idea as a talking points that you can you can initiate the discussion with your clinician, but we are actually not a doctor. So it's just um, our own opinion. So that's, I think the, almost in the ne next slide is the, uh, is the acknowledgement, right, Kevin? Yep. So yeah, we want to really thank the, the Family Foundation giving us this opportunity. Both me and Kevin's lab received funding. We really, um, really grateful to this general support from the uh, Family Foundation for us to uh, get their things going. Like my funding coming in a very difficult time of my lab. And uh, you know, that, that, that funding, Keep, keep me going and eventually we get this national funding to, to move things forward. So we really, really appreciate it for, 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 for receiving this funding in this difficult time and we, we keep things moving. And we also have to thank our collaborator, Bill Scanner. He actually is the person um, designed uh, this gene trap strategy and we're using his strategy to, to build these mice. And also Bill Scanner is helping us generating uh, the induced polypodium stem cell Catering SCN2 mutation. And we are also studying this, uh, this uh, um, neurons differentiated from the uh, induced polypodium stem cell. It's not a part of this talk, but we are like our full lab. The whole lab is the only thing we do is SCN2 for now. So actually, we really um, thank all our collaborators, funder, and everyone that are making this possible for us to do this research. And Kevin, maybe I just give this to you and you introduce your lab and uh, your, your, your funding. Yeah, you you know these guys. Um, this work was uh, was was done primarily by Perry, um, and Carla was helping at the bench every now and then. Um, and this was the this was the end of his uh, thesis, and and just actually a, a big effort from the from a lot of people in the lab. I also wanted to mention uh, very recently, Roy has um, who's done a lot of the modeling and actually the original work for our lab identifying the loss of function cases associated with autism, um, just got a faculty position over at Davis. And we're very excited to see him start his own lab where he's going to be focused very heavily on SCN2A and other uh, neurodevelopmental channelopathies. Um, so with that, I think I wanna turn back to this slide just to mention very quickly, um, I, I know there's at least one person, Jen, in the, in the chat, um, and who's still here that has a child with loss of function four-year-old, is that right, Jacob, um, with epilepsy and autism. And, and the conversation should really, if we're gonna focus on this, should revolve around her, um, how well his seizures are controlled. If they are well controlled, there's absolutely no reason to change your approach. Um, but if there are issues that arise, these are some ideas that we've had um, one of the big troubles that we've we've realized recently is that one of the, potentially one of the the nicest or most interesting classes of potassium channel activators that was on the market recently is um, is a KCNQ activator called ritigabine, and unfortunately it turns your kiddo blue like um, like I think uh, the the girl chewed too much gum in Willy Wonka, um, so that's just not an approach. But I I, I mean we have it. We have this luxury here of having JP and potentially some other people um, who are in the business of developing drugs and potentially they could talk about um, what might be coming down the road um, in terms of these sort of things. So I'll stop sharing um, and then we can just have a round robin with people, I think. Yeah, that was great. Uh, amazing, amazing work. Thank you both so much. Um, it's, it's so exciting to hear that you met and are started this amazing collaboration through one of the foundation's programs, um, our, our FCN Twig collaboration calls. That means a lot to us and that you actually took it as far as publishing together is amazing. Um, so we're super excited. We do have a couple questions that came through in the chat. I'm going to read one right now um, for, for one of our parents. Um, they have one child that has SCN2A and autism, a little girl. They mm -hmm. also have a little boy who does not have SCN2A but has autism. Uh, do, you, do you have any explanations on why that could have happened? Well, as, as Stefan has said before, um, getting a de novo variant in SCN2A is a uh, has absolutely nothing to do with us as parents or you as parents. It just happens, unfortunately. 
Um, all of us carry variations in our genome. Um, and we're lucky that most times they hit bits of our genome that don't matter as much as SCN2A. Um, the case associated with, with both children um, uh, being diagnosed with autism could relate potentially to common variation that's, that's found in all of us um, or could have genetics that, has, that, that happens. I wouldn't say that they're related to each other, um, but probably the best person to answer that would be someone like Stefan. So maybe we could, we could connect the two of them to see what, uh, see what he says. Absolutely, and, and I agree. It, it just, in my experience in the group, it seems like um, it, they probably aren't related. Um, a CN2A is the cause of one child's epilepsy, or I'm sorry, autism, that they do not have epilepsy. And then the other one, um, it's, it's just a different cause and probably, probably unknown at this time and maybe they can continue to do genetic testing to find out. Um, mm -hmm. I can help you with resources um, to get further genetic testing if you'd like. Um, and then Steve, um, Su Susan said that you took over for her. Did you wanna ask your question about the, the late onset epilepsy and the injection in the mouse tail? Um, yeah, it, thank you very much. So, right, I kind of jumped in there kind of late and I kind of caught that slide and I was just like trying to understand what you were referring to, was that like gene therapy? I was just trying to get a better understanding of what exactly you did to the, the mice involved in that late onset um, slide in, in that part of the discussion. Mm. Is that... Sure. So Kevin, can you sh re reshare the slide? We go to the part with the car cartoon mouse. Yeah, hold on one second. Can you talk about this one? No, it was in a prior one. It, uh, uh, it's the, not right when you right when Yang Yang took over. Yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. This one. Uh, not this one. So can you go for the one? Go to my second data. So yes, this is the one. That, I see. that one, right? Yeah, okay, that, that one. So actually, the, this is really a nice approach. Jing Liang, I really want to give him a lot of credit uh, to kind of persuade with me to to do this approach. Like we have been trained in neuroscience, like the AV, it's normally do not go through the blood brain barrier. So most of our previous training is uh, we just inject the virus into the brain and uh, infect or transduce a small portion of the, the neurons that we can see the effect. But uh, in 2017, there's a paper comes out suggesting there's a group in California, I believe it's in, in Caltech, they develop a, uh, a virus that is a new string of virus that is called the AVPHPEB. This particular virus can pass the blood brain barrier so that uh, they can just, uh, we can inject into the tail vein, like uh, in the mouse, we inject it into the blood, like the tail vein is the, is the easiest place for us to inject. For, for human, you know, we just inject it into any, any blood vessel. But uh, for mice, like we do it called a tail vein injection, at that time, this stuff is like we have to ask somebody to package it. It's quite a e quite e expensive. Initially, I don't want to spend the money, but you know, I said, "Well, this is really the something we want to try." I said, "Sure, sure. You know, I want to do something. You don't think it's working? You know, we did it, and you know, we're gonna get this virus. So we spend a, a quite a good money, package this virus, and you know, inject them, and indeed, like we see, pretty good effect. So this virus, I believe, it's still." only can be used for mice, right? I mean, this part, I'm not that expert in the gene therapy for human. This PHBEB is very widely used in mouse. We inject into the tail vein and they can transduce many neurons in the brain. Basically, like we can do this whole body or whole brain rescue. Um, but I don't know if the similar version of the virus is available in human or not. That part I not, lack. Not as of yet. Not as of yet. So, so this okay. PHPEB um, mechanism works via a channel that is found in the blood-brain barrier, specifically in one strain of mouse. So it's not even okay. just mice in general. Okay. It's this type of mouse called C57 Black 6J, and it only works there. Um, but the fact that they identified that has allowed this group, Viviana Gradinaro's group, to yes, develop... Um, 
analogous approaches, and I believe that they have approaches now that work for non-human primates, for example, okay. macaque monkeys, and they're working on versions for humans. That's one of the two big issues that one needs to tackle for gene therapy. The other is avoiding liver toxicity because a lot of these viruses just get trafficked eventually and get broken down by your liver and that's just your normal immune response. Mm -hmm. um, you don't wanna inject yourself with a ton of virus that eventually goes and, and damages your liver. So avoiding that has been the other big challenge. The nice thing is that there's this entire cottage industry, not as large as the one trying to treat COVID-19, but was pretty close before the pandemic started um, to develop these approaches. And so we're hoping soon that these approaches will be amenable for humans. Great, Kevin. Hey, you, know, you know all this background about this virus. Yeah, Great. it's a funky little thing. Yeah. That's nice. There was also a question about when the seizures arise. Like, what is the oh, yes. late onset? Is that true? Kevin, normally we, we, we mentioned like after one year of age, right? That's what we call the late onset. Is that the general consensus? Yeah, the general consensus is that that if you if you have a seizure in your child within the first month at month, and usually it's within the first few days, um, those are the gain of function cases. After a year or or after nine months is more more appropriately ascribed to loss of function. It's the ones in the middle between like three months and nine months. Those are the interesting ones and and the, the harder ones to explain, but also. We know that SCN2A does not just produce pure gain of function and pure loss of function. There are cases that have mixed effects that have complex effects. And those are the ones that, that demand more research. Yeah. Hmm. And actually, I think uh, one of the talks that we're gonna give soon with Jennifer Carney is gonna focus on one of those, K1422E, hmm. um, where there's a mouse model now available. That's a great answer. Uh, we did just have a table talk with Al George and Ingo Helbig that talked about um, what they've learned, how it's more than gains and losses. Um, please feel free to, to check out that video. Um, I have a quick question. Um, with potassium channels, I, I don't know anything about potassium channels. I've only focused on sodium channels because that's where I needed to focus. But I know for sodium channels, we need to be selective and be careful about blocking certain ones or opening certain ones. Is it the same in potassium? Like, do they have certain channels that you have to? Okay. Um, and um, because uh, JP I... Johnson is on the call. Yeah, go I ahead. I was wondering if, if he was open to talk a little bit more. Sure, yeah, I can um, say a little. Um, there are several companies that are working on new potassium channel openers. Um, and we at Xenon are, are one of those companies. We have a couple of things that are in the clinic now. One is actually retigabine, uh, which is the compound that uh, Kevin mentioned that, that has turned people blue. Um, and we're working on that one really um, focused on the KCNQ2 kids mm -hmm. because um, you know they're sick enough that they're not worried about turning blue. Um, you know, we have done a little bit of work to try and reduce the risk of blue um, and other um, problems with that compound. But really, uh, the KCNQ2 kids were um, really sad to see that drug go off the market and wanted access to it. And we're trying trying to get them access to that again. But the other is um, XCN1101, which is kind of a next generation version which has some tweaks that will, uh, we think, reduce the side effect profile and uh, it should not turn people blue. Uh, the reason that retigamine turned people blue is because it has this curious way of binding to itself. And when it binds to itself, it, it creates a blue dye. And the new mm -hmm. compounds uh, aren't able to do that. So. Um, the exciting thing about XCN 1101 is that it's in um, a pretty good size uh, phase two trial right now in adults with focal onset uh, seizures. And we should be hearing the news about that later this year. So fingers crossed. Um, yeah, that's great. 
And so obviously the, the first trial would happen for the KCNQ2 kids, um, but there would be potentially some consideration for the loss of function SCN2A kids down the road. Well, so the, the um, 1101 is being developed right now in adults um, for focal onset seizures, but um, you know, presumably if it was to be approved, then it would be available to, uh, right, to anyone willing to try. Yeah. 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 And so with, uh, with the Ritiga being, we're focused on the KCNQ2 kids. Um, hopefully, I mean, I think, uh, that 1101, since it won't, it should have a better side effect profile might be the better answer for the SCN2A kids. And, um, we really haven't been thinking about 2A as target um, population for that compound, but obviously, you know, we have been following the 2A uh, group for a long time, so we'd be ecstatic if if it was fortunate enough that uh, that they could get used for it. So we're we'll follow this story closely. Yeah, I th I think that's that's the take home from Yang and I is that when we have this curious case of loss of function epilepsy, you have to think outside the box in terms of treatments, and this is one potential approach that wouldn't have occurred uh, or wouldn't have been thought of without doing this work and with honestly without the support of the family foundation so we're very grateful there yeah absolutely oh and just you know a word of you know not to get people too excited even if the phase two study is overwhelmingly successful there will be um you know quite a bit more work that has to be done before that could be available to patients yeah. Um, phase three trials are large and long and expensive, and um, so you're probably looking at a couple more years of, of trials uh, to, before it could get on the market. Otherwise known as the normal trial case, uh, duration as opposed to um, RNA vaccines. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, we appreciate the, um, the tempering of our expectations. Um, we're all, we're a pretty good group of parents that, you know, we're aware it takes a long time, um, but we're just so excited to see movement. Um, and there has been so much movement in the last few years um, and it just keeps getting better every day. So we're, we're working very hard to keep our hope alive. And when we see a slide like you showed where it says that gene therapy, even into adulthood could be beneficial, that's amazing to us. Um, Kevin, were you going to say something about the potassium channels? Um, I think I interrupted you. No, okay. I think JP covered it perfectly. Okay. Are there any potassium channel openers on the market at all right now? Not that I know of. No. Okay. Um, and then Catalina typed a question in here about when NAV 1.6 takes over, um, what changes have you seen in the mice? Any gains in the development? Any significant changes? I think that's coming from a question, um, you know, like what should, what do we see? And like, how does that translate to our kids? Yeah, I think, well, uh, Perry, that was Perry's first question in his graduate work. And, and what he generally found is that that is the age of onset for really identifying deficits in um, in learning at the cellular level. And so when that, and that occurs usually about a week in life, or it starts about a week in life in a mouse. And that translates, mice develop much faster than humans. That, that translates to about a year in life, give or take a few months, plus or minus on either side in a, in a human. And one thing you'll notice there is that you might start to miss milestones um, or have milestone delays. Uh, in terms of sitting upright, in terms of walking, uh, talking, those sort of things. Um, and I, I've talked about this in the past, and perhaps we can, we can link Catalina to some of our other talks that we've given, and, and I can talk with her um, as well. But, but generally, what we find is that the circuits in the brain, when 1.6 takes over in the axon, 1, 2 localized to the dendrites, and it's lost in the dendrites, really arrests the development of, of connections within those dendrites. And it puts them in a state where, the, where basically the circuit pauses. Um, and just like Yang was saying, our hope is, is that if you're able to restore 1.2, um, 
in those dendrites, you might be able to restart that development and have it kick off again. And this is something that that we're very, very, we're all very, very interested in, in pursuing and asking is if you do restore NAB 1.2, either via gene therapy or some sort of small molecule that restores function to near wild type levels, near normal levels, can you get this rescue of behavior? As far as we can tell, what Yang has shown, what we've done in our lab as well, um, that answer appears to be yes in terms of in terms of mice, but mice are not kids. Yeah, so I, I heard a very interesting thing is a uh, mouse is not a tiny human with tail. <laughs> yes. Ashley asked me a direct question, a direct message. I don't know whether she wants to ask that to the group, Ashley. Yeah, sorry, I have kids in the background, but I just was curious um, in restoring the SCN2A function, if you can end up having too much SCN2A and cause issues that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's always a concern. Um, in, in some respects, the gain of function cases are conditions where you have too much SCN2A function. Uh, the real question, I think, is can you have too many copies of SCN2A and too many sodium channels in the membrane, and could that look like gain-of-function? So when we do these gene therapies where we're supposed to rescue uh, this gain of uh, this loss-of-function case, can we go from that blue region past the normal region straight into the red and have a big old problem? Um, I, this is work that's unpublished from our lab, but it looks like the answer is no, actually. And that might be related to the fact that, that NAV 1.2, SCN2A, doesn't live in isolation on the membrane. It's there packaged in this big old scaffold of other things. So they're called beta subunits, they're called anchorins, um, uh, neurofashions, these things that, that localize NAV 1.2 to the membrane. So we've done experiments now where we've overdriven the amount of SCN2A, even in a wild type animal to levels that are two or three times higher than they should be. And the animals actually don't seem to be having troubles as far as we can tell so far. Um, we need to do a bit more work on that to be completely confident of that. But it looks like the gene therapy might have a pretty large window of opportunity in there if we can get it to work. That's awesome, thank you. It's interesting because um, on Saturday or Sunday, when we had our last talk, it was with Stefan and Nadav, and we were talking about this as well, about you know the same thing that Ashley just asked, you know, in in opposite direction. If we um, if we block it, if we block an, a gain of function SCN two A gene, will it turn into a loss of function? Um, and I'm not sure if that's you know if that's been tested the same way that your lab has tested the other direction. Well, I think in some respects, the, the ASOs that are currently being developed um, in Australia by, um, by Steve Petru's lab are a test of that, um, because that is a case where the ASOs target both the, the allele that's been affected that has gain of function, but also targets the normal allele. And I believe under their conditions, they see um, increased survival in those animals, but also it's with a pretty significant knockdown um, almost to the levels that Yang Yang is, is, is inducing um, in his case. And so one of the things you have to consider is that all of these phenotypes that Yang is observing might actually be present depending on how well you, you titrate or how well you dose that, that sort of ASO approach. And so one consideration there is that if you're able to develop a specific in small molecule inhibitor, that might be much better because you can dose that day by day by day. Mm -hmm and change the levels by the kid's weight, by how, how active the kid is. Whereas with an ASO, you might have to, every three months, you have to do a, an injection into the spine and, and hope that you get the dose right. Um, I, I don't know what's better. Obviously, anything would be better than what we have right now. Um, but there are multiple approaches that I think are being developed in the, in the field. And not, there's not going to be a single winner. There's going to be multiple approaches. Um, geared towards helping these kids. Great, that's what we're hoping for, multiple approaches. Um, and everything just keeps getting better, right? That's, um, no, yeah. 
uh, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to take yourself off mute and ask directly. Kevin or Yang, you haven't tried retigabine in any of the, your uh, experiments, have you? I haven't. I, I don't want my, no, I, I, I haven't tried that as of yet. I mean, we, we just finished this stuff up and, um, and uh, Perry graduated. So <laughs> it's on the docket of things to try, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, the list is long right now. Yeah, lots, and, lots of possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if there's some tool compounds from a certain company in Vancouver, we could try. Um, that'll be closer to a final product. That would be interesting to to uh, work on. We'll keep you in mind. All right, good. And yeah, Yan as well, please. <laughs> All right. Well, it's getting late there for a lot of us. Um, so. Yeah, well then let me close it up. If nobody has any more questions, I will, um, I, we, we, get a, we get a half hour back, that's great. Um, last chance to ask a question? Yeah, happy to hang around. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Kevin and Yang for volunteering your time to help us understand this exciting work better. It gives us just so much hope for our kids' future. And thank you to the families who joined us today. Your questions and comments were very insightful. And if you're like me, you're gonna think of questions later. So please digest the science, think about this. And as always, we're here for you. Just reach out to us and we'll do our best to get the questions answered for you. Um, there are still seven more talks in our RX Hope virtual series. Um, be sure to register for them in advance and we'll make the recordings available as soon as possible. Um, and I have to end with there's still so much work to be done and we could really use your help. There's two major ways to get involved right now with the foundation um, through the annual campaign that we just extended through the end of August. We are only halfway to our goal. Um, so we have a lot of work to do and we're really hoping that all the families take an active role in fundraising in the, in the next three weeks. Um, also, if you have not already, please do register for the SC and Toy Clinical Trial Readiness Study that's focusing on, on uh, non-seizure endpoint measurements. And this is, you know, this is going to tie right in with these treatments that are around the corner for our kids. And when I say around the corner, just to be fair to Yang and, and Kevin and JP, I mean years, but still, um, they're, for us, they're coming, right? Um, there's going to be links on the website, and there's also in the recording in the last 20 seconds of the recording of this session, we're going to put more links for you so you can access everything I'm talking about. Okay, well, thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great night. All right, thank you very much, everybody.